Afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by Community Playmaker Magazine. Our session today is entitled Innovative Partnerships, How Managed Services Are Reshaping Local Government Operations, and we have a fantastic lineup for you today. I'm Ashley Whitaker. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Community Playmaker Magazine and a partner with the Sports Facilities Companies, and I'm going to be your host today. We have 60 minutes blocked out for you. Uh, we plan to talk for about 50 of those and then offer 10 minutes for Q&A. Uh, at any time, you can enter your questions into the chat that's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll be watching those. We might pop them in as we go, or we will hold them to the end, uh, but you can ask anytime. This webinar will be recorded, and we will provide the link to the recording as well as some contact information for our organizations featured today so that you can reach out to them after the webinar if you are interested. Uh, with that, a little bit more about our topic. We are really excited to talk to you today about how municipalities are changing the way they're doing things through operating partnerships. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about how they work and why these managed services create efficiency and enhance service. A lot of you might be familiar with that from wastewater treatment or waste management or IT. Today, we've got some incredible providers uh, who partner with local governments in the area of sports and recreation, libraries, and emergency services. With that, I'm going to let our speakers introduce themselves. Jason Clement, please kick us off. Hi, Jason Clement, CEO, founding partner with Sports Facilities Companies. Uh, we uh, assist municipalities in the planning, development, design, construction, and then ongoing outsourced management of sports, recreation, tourism venues, uh, RV parks, all sorts of things that are combined in that recreation, uh, recreation space. We've been doing it for 20 years. We celebrated our 20 year anniversary last year. Uh, and we currently manage in an outsourced capacity over 100 venues uh, around the country. Uh, we're headquartered here in the Tampa Bay region and uh, great to be with everybody today. Thanks for being here, Jason. Larry? Hi, Larry Consalva. I'm the President and Chief Operating Officer of IXP Corporation. Uh, IXP is a public safety managed services company. We, um, we deal with local governments, we deal with colleges, universities, we deal with commercial campuses. And our focus is on the emergency communication, both the operations and the technology. Uh, we've been doing this for about 20 years. Um, some of our clients have been with us the entire time, and uh, we're looking forward to another 20 years. Thanks, Dave. Welcome, Larry. And Todd. Thanks, Ashley. Hi, I'm Todd Frager, the CEO of Library Systems and Services, otherwise known as LSNS and LAC Federal. I've been in the space for 30 years, helping governments solve for um, looking for to solve with innovative solutions. But what we do is turnkey managed services, as well as a la carte consultative services with a library operating platform we created called Library IQ. Um, we've been doing it for 45 years, over 900 employees. And again, we focus really on the library and museum space and full managed services. Right now, we have over 90 customers throughout the United States, from California to Florida. Largest system being Riverside County with 35 libraries, two museums, servicing two and a half million people for 27 years, as well as mid-sized libraries and smaller libraries around the country. Um, the heart of it for our product is we believe the back of the house, non-patron engagement services um, can be aggregated together in a consortium manner to provide better services and value for our customers, really focusing the product and the engagement on patron facing engagement for our customers. So I'm um, excited to talk to everybody and looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. Thanks to all our speakers for being here today. Now, as we get started, you heard a little bit about all, how all these different firms work and the services they provide. And I think one of the first questions I want to get started with is talking about the relationship with local government. What is an operating partnership or managed services? What does that mean? A little bit about the structure and maybe how that's different from privatization. Um, so Todd, can you get us started? Yeah, thanks, Ashley. So it very much is a partnership with the elected officials to provide our services. Uh, privatization in its traditional sense really is the transfer of assets, uh, by definition, from a government entity to a private entity. In our case, it is not. It, the assets remain the property of the local governments. The physical assets, the collections, the buildings, everything remains the property of the of municipality. Uh, what we're providing are the, the services themselves, the expertise, the staffing to make it successful. Uh, we continue with all the partnerships or expand partnerships that currently exist with the municipalities. In our case, we're very focused on the friends, the volunteers, the foundations, 
everything remains intact or improved upon. And it's critical to know that we don't brand the services as LSNS or as, as our services. It still very much looks local with the local branding and local logo. Uh, you maintain governance, authority, and local control. Now, I know there's a lot of parallels there with how the sports facilities companies does things. Uh, Jason, anything to add there on how SFC works with their clients? Yeah, I would just layer in. It's a, it's a very similar model to, to what Todd just shared in terms of the local branding of the complexes and uh, facilities that we manage. Uh, the, the only thing I would add, um, which I know Todd does as well, knowing the LSNS model, is that we do everything in terms of the operation. We market, we sell, we program. We run all of the team and the payroll, um, the HR, all of that uh, is inclusive in what we do in our, in our outsourced model. Uh, we like to say that uh, it's your asset, it's your vision, but it's our responsibility to execute on that vision and go achieve the goals and objectives um, with any community or client that you know we're blessed to work with. Absolutely. And speaking of responsibility, emergency services, huge responsibility in communities. Larry, can you tell us a little bit about how your relationships are structured? Sure. Structured. I mean, obviously contractually, but we understand that for the elected and executives in any community, there has to be a willingness to try and deliver services to that community in a different fashion. So eliminating pain points for people and technology are generally at the highest order when we, we try and establish a partnership. But our goal is to you know, provide our services under a contractual metric to meet industry metrics for accreditation, for training, for you know, career opportunities, and not to take away any political capital from any of the elected officials in a town, but to enhance that by creating a jobs program, by creating community-based um, events, you know, training programs, you know, educational programs, things that local municipalities don't seem to have the resources to do any longer. So our model is different. It's based upon a proprietary methodology that looks at the governance, the operations, the technology, and the facilities. And then we have multiple models that can fill in those gaps for a community based upon how that community wants services delivered to its, its constituents. One of the things you just mentioned, Larry, is about pain points and how that, you know, that really is a driver and a decision maker for local government leaders to to maybe select um, outsourced or managed services. Can you talk a little bit more about um, what are those pain points for your clients and what are some of the benefits they receive from IXP? Sure. Um, well, nationally, there's a couple of hundred thousand vacancies in the 911 arena right now and recruiting and retaining employees is, is paramount. The challenge of, you know, the cost of doing that over and over and over again, the recruiting, the hiring, the training, the discipline, the legal aspects of managing a workforce, um, as opposed to being able to have a one-stop um, shop to go to a, a local company such as ourselves, and you know, we're the only ones in our space, and, and, and we essentially take away those soft costs, which reduces the cost to those municipalities by about 25%. You know, then we provide under you know, a performance-based contract call answering dispatching times that can really be measured. Uh, we, we enhance that with our accreditations for law enforcement, fire, and EMS accreditations. And, and that gives a much better platform for communities that are really struggling to even fill in the number of seats that they have inside of their centers. So you know, we guarantee we're going to fill those seats. We fill them locally with people from the community. And um, and that's just part of our success is being, you know, part of the fabric of the community to come in and provide an essential service. Absolutely. Filling seats, recruiting HR hot topics in local government. I know there is a shortage of lifeguards, uh, and that's something SFC assists with. Jason, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the pain points in parks, sports, recreation, events, entertainment, the long list of assets you guys manage and, and how SFC assists? Yeah, just to pick up on the labor topic first, uh, similarly, uh, recruiting, retaining, developing, and providing upward mobility for you know the key talent is something that we offer because of the national platform that most local uh, entities or local governments can't can't offer. So we're able to 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 get the higher quality of folks 
and retain them and, and keep them involved. You know, in addition to that, because of the development and training um, platform that we have, um, you know, we're able to bring people in from outside that would um, maybe not be looking for a relocation to that particular community for just a one-off um, type of development. And because we have 2,700 team members around the country who are passionate about our mission, improving the health and economic vitality of the communities we serve, they're looking for that next best community, you know, to go into and set up roots and um, create that that opportunity. You know, the other pain point, uh, at least from our perspective, is financial that many municipalities have or outsource collegiate university campuses or anybody else. Uh, and that is these are these are assets and they're depreciating assets in some ways. Um, but there's also a PL that goes along with them, and there's an opportunity to um, generate uh, funds and resources financially that um, can, uh, you know, replenish the next turf field or the next hardwood court or the next pool or aquatic center. So we drive a better financial performance. Part of that is in the staffing. Um, similarly, we average about a 25% savings just because of the fringe and the benefit package, um, you know, for that same team member um, by, by hiring them onto our team and platform versus a local government um, platform in that way. But the level of programming and activity, um, you know, when when a municipality plugs into our network, they get national best practices in terms of programming, um, tournaments, events, league camp, clinic, all of those sorts of things. And so we're just able to drive a better bottom line financial performance and the way that we measure it, uh, KPIs and dashboards relative to expenses as a percent of income and other things um, that allow us to drive that. And then there's a qualitative aspect to this as well. Uh, you know, it's it's highly personal. All of these are really important services. Obviously, I'm a little bit biased, um, but it's it's uh, you know when you put your kids and what they're going to be doing and their activities um, at at stake as well, uh, it's highly personal um, for families inside inside these communities. And we bring a different level of um, national programming and activities and the best content and. Um, and items to put inside of these venues that most municipalities who are doing, you know, as good as they can, you know, it's one park and rec director or one sport program person. They just don't have the network that they can plug into to pick the best from around the country to, um, you know, put into each one, one of these municipalities. You know, the last thing on this, and forgive me for rambling on, is political cover. Uh, you know, when you spend 20, 30, 100 million dollars on a brand new complex or asset, uh, we like the responsibility. Uh, we we take that uh, personally. It's it's not just a responsibility for us. It's a passion for us, and it's really a burden that we 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 carry to make sure that these venues are performing quantitatively and qualitatively at the level that you know these elected officials put their political capital on the line for. And uh, we like that, and we love that partnership. Mm, absolutely. Todd, I saw lots of nods when uh, Jason was talking about uh, programming and national best yeah. practices, and you've got 90 locations, so a lot of pain you guys are solving. What are what are some of those hot buttons for you guys in the library side? Yeah, I think I love the answers because it is very similar. Saving money, I think what we're finding is that people don't want to raise taxes, but there's a huge demand on community services. People want more services, demand more services but there aren't the resources to do it. So we're able to stretch those dollars. And I think a primary, we're in the same ballpark, 20% savings as well. But I think the key for us is expertise. And I think, you know, Jason's touched on it, Larry's touched on it. Governments are stretched and our municipal partners are stretched as well. By the time they go through, you know, whether it's public safety, health, education, infrastructure, there's not a lot of bandwidth left or resources left. Typically our budgets a library budget and museum budget, one, 2% of the entire municipal budget, but the demands on those services are greater than they've ever been. And I think our model allows them to really expand upon those services while saving money. And it's just, it's a win-win for everybody. But I think more than anything, what they love and appreciate is that we bring expertise. We wake up every day thinking about how to make these facilities the best they can be where their people just don't have the capacity, the background, or the, the, you know, just to be able to focus on libraries, museums, sports facilities. It's our passion. It's what we do every day. And I think our partners appreciate our level of commitment. So they know that we're thinking about it, even when they don't have the time to think about it. It's a good point. Uh, a lot of people, a lot, a lot of things to cover in local government from infrastructure to uh, talent recruiting and libraries and parks and emergency services, critical uh, pieces. 
Now you mentioned the win-win. Can you, uh, Todd, tell us a little bit more? What are what are a couple of the wins um, in your portfolio of libraries that you maybe want to highlight today for our audience? Yeah, and it's the fun part of the job. I mean, there's nothing better than going out and spending time in our facilities with our communities. It's what it makes it all worthwhile. I, I think one that um, probably touches me more than others, in particular, Homestead, Florida, I think is a great example for us. It's right outside Miami. Uh, the community has been devastated, whether it's hurricanes or the Air Force losing, uh, leaving. It just was going through a lot of economic challenges. They had a, a library facility with Miami-Dade County, 50-year-old facility. It looked like it. It was a more traditional library with old, outdated stacks of books, but just not well kept. And the city itself had very little control over the, what was going on in the library while still making an economic contribution to it. So the city had decided, hey, we're going to build our own or we want to you know, build something new and innovative and creative without raising taxes. So they did a private public-private partnership with ourselves and some other people that came in. We helped design, build, and create. We call They call a librarian because it's the library of the future. Uh, libraries are changing. They're not what they used to be, thank goodness. Um, they still have the traditional services that you would want, but they're much more expansive. So I would invite people to go online or to take a look at the Cybrarium in Homestead, Florida. But I think the key was it's the revitalization of their Main Street. A lot of Main Streets have kind of seen better days, but there's a desire to keep them vibrant and active. So by building a mixed-use facility, because it's not a traditional standalone library, it's got entertainment, it's got retail, it's got a library all combined together in the heart of the, of the downtown Main Street, uh, we've driven incredible traffic and vitality back to Main Street for, for the Cyberarium. Uh, the community loves it. It was really great for me when I was there for the grand opening, you know, watching the families come in and seeing this beautiful facility with a VR cube and technology and makerspace and a kitchen and recording studio and everything they never had before in that community, watching families break down in tears as they were entering the building. It just it made it all worthwhile for me and told me we were doing something great. I think that theme of of technology is one that's probably going to touch everybody on this call. The the private sector innovation available, um, and in the library side, you know, books are historically the place where people go to find knowledge, and now that's really rooted in technology um, and the access to broadband and other things. Huge uh, concerns across communities. Now, Larry, I know technology is a big piece of IXP and how you guys create efficiency. What are some of your best projects or best results? One is an example. It's our Chatcom um, facility in Sandy Springs, Georgia. It's a 911 communication center that serves four communities in two separate counties, um, Sandy Springs and Johns Creek in Fulton County and Dunwoody and Brookhaven in DeKalb County. Now, we built the original business plan for that over 15 years ago for the client. The client then turned around and asked us, can you guys build it and run it for us? We built the plan. We like the plan. So um, their estimate was that if they were going to do it themselves, it would have taken them four years to bring this, this system live, 50 plus procurements. And we did it in six months. And in six months, we went live. We, we hired everybody. We trained everybody. And we've been operating that, that system ever since. And it, it's an ultimate model for us because everything's included in that price. So we give that client predictability and sustainability financially. And that includes all the technology, all the evergreening, all the maintenance, all the support. And we manage that every day with our team there. So not only are we supplying unique communication services for each community the way they want it done in their in their community, but we also supply and support all the technology. So it is just as new today as it was 15 plus years ago, and uh, and it functions flawlessly. Um, but the predictability and the sustainability for the client has been really paramount. They know exactly what it's going to cost them every year. They're not going to be hit with unusual overtime expenses. They're not going to be hit with unusual technology expenses. It's all included in our price, and we meet that price every day. That's that's incredible to hear about an all-in-one solution. And I, I think you hit on the, the predictability of the pricing model. So huge for, for local governments who are stretched, their budgets are under pressure, knowing they're going to get your level of service with that flat fee. 
Um, talking about all in one, Jason, I uh, know, you know, what's included in a sports facility, uh, certainly technology, like we talked about, but there's so many other factors. Um, what are some of your favorite or or best examples of, of some projects that SFC is serving? Yeah, thanks for letting me go last so I could think about this <laughs> a little bit. But, uh, you know, in two ways, um, one one would be taking on existing assets and existing complex operations. So Brandon, Mississippi, where we inherited um, all of the existing staff for this for this venue, um, we got to train them up and develop them. We report still through Parks and Rec um, in that way, but we we ba essentially took on the Parks and Rec, you know, within the city. We don't do that all the time. Sometimes just a complex or just a facility, but in this case, we did, and um, we doubled revenue. Um, we we've, we've tripled economic impact. We've um, brought in some new programming and activity that's happening there with the additional resources that have been created as a result of um, this programming. We've been able to upgrade facilities um, over the last couple of years in, in partnership with the city. That's how they chose to utilize the resources. Uh, in other places, you ask, you know, how do you define success? Um, we recognized in, in one community in Illinois, they, they said, okay, great, you've improved the bottom line. What's that mean? And we found out for them what resonated with the community it was X number of potholes that we got to fix because we improved the bottom line for the city, you know, in certain ways. Um, so Brandon, Mississippi is a good example for a new build. Um, the city of Hoover, Alabama opened up a new complex in 2018. Um, it's one of my personal favorites because it had an existing stadium, an old minor league stadium, th 30 years old. Uh, the SEC baseball tournament is played there. Uh, in fact, next week is the SEC baseball tournament we're excited about in, in Hoover. And then there was an addition of a, 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 an indoor sports center with a bunch of courts, um, flexible space, some outdoor fields, a tennis and pickleball complex, uh, an aquatic splash pad, uh, RV park, 200 um, space, RV park, 200 plus and others. And that's one where um, when we went to the city. Uh, we said, hey, what are your goals for success here? What do we need to achieve here? And they said, hey, we want to retain the SEC tournament. Just got an extension on that, by the way. Um, secondly, we want to spur economic growth in and around. And there's been massive commercial development in and around this complex, um, you know, since since it was built. And third, we want to provide opportunity for our local residents um, to, to come in. And Ashley knows this story, but I'll never forget going in in our first quarter of, you know, first three months of coming in. And we reforecasted the bottom line and we reforecasted that we were going to beat the bottom line by, I think, seven hundred thousand dollars. And uh, I went in just to the city manager, city administrator there, like ready to pat ourselves on the back for how we had done. And he said, hey, that's great that you're going to beat the bottom line by seven hundred K. Where was that in one of our goals or definitions of success, um, which rarely you hear somebody say we weren't looking for you to make that much money. Um, and I said, oh, well, it wasn't. He's like, what were the three goals again? And, you know, I, I explained what they just were. And he said, hey, whatever you're doing to drive that level of profit, if there's a way that we can provide more community access than just what you're doing to drive the private, private for profit, uh, we would like to do that. Just hit the budget. Just come back and hit the budget, which rarely you hear somebody say, but we were able to do that then, you know, tweak it. So Ashley, that's one of my favorite stories because it was humbling for me, first of all. And secondly, it's forced us to always recognize the client's goals are the goals, not our goals. And whatever the client's goals are, that's what we build the operation to go achieve. And when we do that, it's success for, for, for everybody. So we're doing a lot more proms, a lot more dances. We're still doing revenue generating things in Hoover, um, but we're doing a lot more of those sorts of activities that serve the public really well, because after all, it's their asset. Absolutely. And serving the public, I think that kind of brings us to the next question here, because unlike wastewater treatment, uh, these all these services today are up close and personal with local taxpayers, with the public. And sometimes they're not quite sure about what we're talking about when we say outsource management um, and what that implies for them. So, Todd, I'll start with you this time. Um, you know, what are maybe some typical community concerns and, you know, how do you address those? Yeah, it's it's very common. Um, you know, there are concerns about the staff. What's going to happen to the staff? Are they going to be in a good spot? Uh, we care deeply about them. They're part of our community. Are they going to be well taken care of? So that's probably... Uh, number one on the list, obviously, there's local control and making sure that there's not a lack of that in this process. Uh, but I'll start with the staff because that is a for us to be successful, it really is going to count on that existing staff in many cases to become part of our staff. So and they are local. So it's not an outsourced situation where we're going to do this from a remote location. We're still doing it on the ground in the community with local people, which is what makes it a win. So for us, a lot of it is about transparency and education. 
kind of getting rid of any misinformation or unknown information, just so everyone understands what we do, how we do it. We explain it in great detail. We spend a lot of time with the local staff that's on the ground there. Um, we spend time teaming them up with people within our own organization who have similar jobs. So they can ask them lots of open questions about what it's like to work for us versus working for the city or county. In our case, um, we're fortunate that we're able to offer them all the same title, same pay, same tenure, but with great competitive benefits. So a lot of that angst of personally, what's going to happen to me, we can take right off the table so they can get a, a very high comfort level with us to want to work with us. But it's, you know, it's really a lot about just spending time educating, clearing up misnomers. Um, we have a lot that's documented in regards to expectations. Larry talked about service level agreements and everything. So it's all out there. It's for the public to understand and see what our level of commitment look like, looks like, what success looks like. As a private company, uh, we have to be better than what people think we are because in functioning in this government space, there's, in our case, there's a large microscope on us and how we perform. So we're not political. Uh, we're very responsive. And because of all that, I, I think, you know, we're, we, we're able to perform at a very high level in a very transparent manner. Mm. A lot of education goes into that to help people understand what, what that means. What does it mean to them on that personal level? Um, Larry, uh, this, you know, emergency service is very personable. Everybody wants to know when I call 911, someone's going to answer my call. Um, what are some of the concerns you guys deal with and how do you, um, how do you address those? Well, first and foremost, people think that we're going to take 911 out of their community and run it from some other place. And that's not true. We have to run it from the community. And, and for our folks, they have to be nice. They have to be nice when they answer the phone because they're dealing with somebody who's in a, some form of, of uh, a tragedy or uh, some form of needing help. So they have to be concise. They have to be nice. They have to get that information quickly and get a public safety resource, police, fire, EMS, on the way to those people who, who have that need. Um, so you know, we laugh about it a lot and we talk with our folks, but number one, they have to be nice and they have to be well-trained and they have to, um, you know, somebody's calling 911, they're, they're looking for a police officer, a paramedic, a fireman, now, but they're talking to a dispatcher and dispatcher has to really comprehend what the problem is and get the appropriate resources to them. And, and that's what a lot of communities are facing when they're putting sworn officers in their 911 centers. I mean, it's a very expensive resource. They're, they are from, in some places they're from the community, but in some places they're not. So we, we have to be part of the fabric of, of our communities. We have to know the streets. We have to know the buildings. We have to have supporting technology that makes us more efficient. Um, but first and foremost, we have to you know, be part of that community, whether we're in the school system, whether a community night out. They have to know and see us as a, a valuable resource that's going to get them help when they need it. Um, so whether it's 911, 311, or over the past two years, we've been doing a number of things in behavioral health. It's all about shortening the path to care and shortening the path to help. I want to pause with you for a minute on the behavioral health side. I know that's been a growing issue. Can you maybe expand on that just for a second on, on what you mean by that and how you guys support? Now, over the past few years, there's been a number of initiatives around the country to uh, reduce the number of calls going into 911. Some of it's tied to the funding of police. Uh, some of it's just tied to other community you know, goals and metrics. But what we found is that when um, somebody calls 911 and a police officer is dispatched and it's a behavioral health issue, there, there are limited things that the police can do. There, there are a number of models now around the community where they're pairing clinicians with police officers and paramedics and firemen. Um, whether or not that's sustainable, you know, we don't know. I don't think anybody knows now. And, and with the 988, you know, the suicide prevention hotline, we believe that that last you know, mile of care is critical because for a lot of these solutions, the people will go there, whether it's law enforcement, who has very limited things they can do, they can make an arrest or they could do not, not make an arrest. Um, if there is an arrest, there's a potential for a use of force. Um, so they don't really want to go on these calls. And these are people that are you know, part of the community that are repeat callers to the emergency services. 
So um, over the past year, two years now, we've partnered with uh, Catholic Charities in New Jersey, and we have actually um, placed over 800 people into their care system directly, whether it's taking the call, taking a call from 911, taking a call directly to our, um, our crisis navigators, and then sending a Lyft car, an Uber, or making an appointment for that person to get into a care system is, is what we're doing now. And we think it's it's something that's needed. These are not calls that need to go to 911. They're, they're people who have a need with homelessness, drug addiction, uh, behavioral issues, um, and they need, they need the shortest path to care. Great example of some innovation in your service responding to community need. I want to go back a, a second to what you you said earlier on being nice. I know that uh, Jason being nice as part of the guest first services and and again integrating into the community. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the concerns on on the SFC side and and how we address those? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, if you don't mind me um, jumping on the last point there, um, you know, thank goodness, Larry, for that that service. Right, um, I think for both Todd and I, we get the opportunity to hopefully help upstream, you know, with these families through education and the power of resources or sport and recreation and being healthy um, to, you know, build up a lifestyle, um, mental, social, spiritual, physical health in a way that um, less of those calls are coming through to you, but you still have to be reactive to, you know, all of the calls that are coming through. I didn't realize that that could be a, a common thread through what our or each of our organizations do, um, but it's something that's really important to us um, organizationally is how do we get upstream and improve the health of a community, right? Kids, adults, families in this way. So I suppose, Ashley, that could be a definition of being nice. Um, but but one of the things that we're trying to, to do there um, is obviously provide best in class service and customer service. Guest first is our customer service platform um, for training and development for our team. But it's also provide that programming and that activity that is sport, health, recreation, um, but it's full body, you know, mental, uh, mind, body, spirit, if you will, um, where where it makes sense to, to really improve the health um, for these communities. And we recognize that these assets that we're blessed to manage um, aren't free and they aren't cheap to develop and maintain. Um, so there is a cost to play and there is a cost to participate in what we do. Um, so one of the things that we developed maybe four years ago, five years ago, is we, we launched a not-for-profit arm that comes along with us um, to where we'll go build community partnerships. And, you know, if if the local grocery store or banker or attorney um, wants to, to provide a sponsorship opportunity inside of our venue, and, and sure, we'll put the sign up and we'll do all of those things. But really what we want to take is, you know, as many of those dollars as we can, and we want to point them toward providing and sponsor, sponsoring, um, scholarshipping kids that might not have the ability to play from a socioeconomic perspective. We believe in our heart that if kids qualify for free and reduced lunch, that they should qualify for some form of free and reduced play. We believe it's that important um, you know, to the society, and we believe that we can get upstream of some of these societal challenges that we're having that Larry just described and articulated very well if more families and kids get the opportunity to participate in some of the things that we get to do um, and that we get to provide and, and facilitate within the facilities that we're a part of. Big piece of that is being able to meet people where they are um, and, and find out what they need. And that's, that's really unique to every community. Um, and that really kind of talks about community engagement. Um, so Jason, you mentioned about programming and the uh, access program. How do you engage with the community to know what they need and what they want? Yeah, there's a there's a head and a heart um, piece to this, right? So I'm going to start with with the head part, and uh, we really look at data. Um, we we look at you know tracking these devices. Um, you know where are people coming from? Where are they going? You know once they leave these complexes, a big part of the reason, a, a big number of the complexes that we manage are sports tourism venues, where we're bringing in visitors from outside the community to play. And then stay and spend money in the in the communities that you know we we partner with, and so we use data. Where are they coming from? How long are they staying? And where you know where are they going afterward? And and that helps spur the economic growth and justify some of the things that happen um, from an ancillary perspective um, within the community. Um, and then we also just take a look at how many participants are there by sport and by age and by gender. 
um, within uh, you know a regional demographic or community demographic. Where are they going right now? Um, are there existing service providers? And then ultimately um, work our way into how many should we expect to come and play? You know, what's a win? What's just you know hitting the bar? And what's underperforming? And so we we manage all of that from the head perspective, so that um, Ashley, we can bring in the right level of programming and the types of programming that the community from a data perspective is asking for. Uh, similarly with the ancillary services, whether that's food and beverage, retail, merchandise, all of those things that come along you know, with, with uh, these types of complexes that we manage. And then the hard part of it is um, just going out and building a relationship with the community and asking them, you know, what do we need to keep doing? Uh, what's going well? What do we need to maintain and grow? What do we need to stop doing? It's, it's not helpful. It's not serving you well. And what do we need to start doing? We call it a keep, stop, start. Um, and that's the hard part of it. Um, heart, not hard, the heart part of it. And, um, and that's how you build strategic alliances within the community. And then we'll utilize all of the communication channels that you would think of, and then some to go communicate, hey, we heard you, here's what we're doing, and here's how we've done, right? And here's how we've delivered on it. And that's something that we found is critically important. Um, Todd alluded to it earlier. Um, that it's really important to tell you what we've done and show the community what we've done because elected officials have invested a lot into these places and uh, we see ourselves as um, storytellers in a good way, um, nonfiction storytellers, <laughs> to tell the truth about how, you know, this is how this is going and all the success that's happened as a result of, of, of their investment um, in us, but, but in the assets. I love that piece on storytelling. The community needs to hear what's going on in these different uh, businesses and these different facilities so they they understand the value as well. Um, Todd, head, heart, how do you guys figure it out? Libraries are such a hub of activity in a community. Um, how do you guys know what programs to offer and how do you engage with the community? Yeah, I think Jason did a great job teeing it up because a lot of it is data, it's analytics. I think historically with libraries in particular, it was always, uh, you know, I think, I feel, Seems like we're doing a really good job, but it's really hard to measure those things. So, you know, through our experience of operating libraries for the last 27 years, 90 different library systems, um, we were able to actually look at the software that was available and the tools that were in the industry and realize that there really wasn't anything. It's an underserved industry. There isn't a lot of good data that comes out of it. So we took it upon ourselves about three years to start our own initiative, and we created a product called Library IQ Analytics. And it's really an operating dashboard for libraries to understand what's happening within the building, outside the building, community demographics. A big part of it for us is that we know traditionally most libraries, 20% of the population at best is using the facility, using the programming and attending. There's probably 80% of the population that's not taking advantage or that building doesn't know what the other 80% wants and doesn't cater to them and doesn't even try to attract them. So we build a platform that allows the staff and the community and the municipal leaders to really see what's going on within the community. It takes a look at where people are coming from, what those people look like, um, what they might be interested in, what's important to them. So we can build more programming, more things within the library that would attract lots of different people that aren't traditionally brought into the system. So for us, it's again, it's about having great analytics, um, being able to share that out and making it very visible for the community to see and making sure that the building and the that all the programming remains relevant uh, from now through the next several decades. Mm, absolutely. Um, Larry, you actually kind of meant touched on this earlier on the uh, technology, the transparency and the metrics. Can you kind of expand a little bit on, on how you um, both uh, know what to offer and how do you communicate that story um, in terms of community engagement? Sure. I mean, first off, every community is unique. And I think, you know, to be in this business, you have to really respect that. So it's not a one size fits all. We see that a lot in consolidated or regional centers where it's one size fits all and every community that's participating is not getting what they really desire. So the chief officers aren't getting the information they need to make resourcing decisions. They're not looking at the analysis or analytics for their community. So if you have a team of people who come from the industry, such as we do, you know, people who really um, wanted to see change brought into the public safety emergency communication arena, it's easy to establish a relationship with uh, existing clients and potential clients to really understand that they are unique 
And in order for us to be successful, we have to treat that uniqueness, you know, as a, a high priority. So we don't believe it's a one size fits all model. And we think that everybody has to get exactly what they want, whether it's the elected officials, the administrative officials, the chief officers, they have to trust in us that we're going to provide them the information that makes them better at doing their job because we listen to them and we document the metrics and the requirements that they have for their community. It's not really complicated to sit down with somebody and say, how do you want it to work in your community? But so many people have been so turned off to this for so long that they forget it's their community and they get to say how it's going to work there. Our goal is to enhance that with analytics, to enhance that with technology, to enhance that with community programs, so that at the end of the day, it looks like one large team that's fully integrated and not a bunch of, you know, uh, organizations going in different directions that just create chaos. Now, uh, with your data and analytics, when we talk about transparency and accountability to the taxpayers, to the local residents, what are some of the mechanisms you use? Do you guys put that out on social media? Do you do a press release? How do you get the information into the hands of the local residents? Larry? For us, it's it's really interesting because we, we utilize the data to become more efficient, but the client owns the data. We don't publicize the data. We give the client, you know, two forms of management reports every month, one that's very operationally centric around the uh, what chief officers are looking for for their community and another one that has a little bit more information that the elected officials and administrative officials are, but the data belongs to the community. We, uh, we don't, um, we don't uh, participate on social media about some of the platforms. Uh, we, we utilize the tools that we have available to us, but the data and the information belongs to our client. We use it to make ourselves more efficient but it's, it's not in an open, transparent fashion. So, I mean, we're talking about public safety information. We're talking about criminal information. Um, we have to have that trust of that client that we're going to preserve that information and keep it within the boundaries of the law that we have to operate under. It's a great point. And, and I think probably a big differentiator between Jason and Todd as well, who are probably a little bit more of an open book, pun intended. Um, Todd, how about you? Do you guys use social media? How do you get uh, your information out there so that the community members understand some of the great things you're doing? Yeah, and I, I think it's consistent with Larry from a perspective that we take the lead from our customers. We don't have a voice separate from their voice, but we do a lot of the work because they don't have the, they shouldn't, and they don't really always have the capacity to put this information together, we do. So our team, our marketing team, our, our library experts will build monthly reports, annual reports, social posts, uh, just different posts that we basically architect and then we share through multiple channels with our customer for approval and input. So at the end of the day, our customer will say, hey, we're going to put this out on our website or we're going to put this out directly or you guys put this out. But it's always one voice and one message and with the approval of our customer. I hear the spirit of collaboration in both Larry and Todd's answers. You know, it really does come down to that partnership. Um, so Jason, to you, how's that collaboration work for sports facilities companies with your clients? Yeah, just say ditto uh, to what they mentioned. <laughs> uh, each, each client's unique. Each customer has, uh, you know, a different way they want uh, information disseminated. And uh, we have certain ways that we would, um, we can advise and recommend, but ultimately then, you know, it's their call and how we do that. Uh, they own the data and the information, and then we make sure that we execute on the uh, appropriate way to message uh, into the community. But I will say this, because I, I think you use these words, Ashley, in the question, accountability and transparency is really important for us, um, for anybody that outsources. I would just say, whether it's these services or others that aren't represented um, on, the, on the Zoom, that if um, a local municipality is considering outsourcing to an organization, really check in and check the references on how accountable are they and then how do they collaborate? Not when things are going well, but when something happens, right? Because not everything goes perfect all the time. So what does that collaboration look like? And then what's the ongoing regular communication structure and routine in which, um, you know, you'll be managing these venues or managing these uh, 
these these resources or the, this organization. Uh, how often do you want to meet with them? What kind of reporting do you want to see from them? Um, but but get examples in terms of how they would propose doing those sorts of things because that's um, that's that's a really different differentiated component in terms of who you choose to work with in any sort of outsourced relationship. <clears throat> Absolutely. And I, I think that spirit of collaboration is one that goes into so many different elements of how these partnerships work. Um, one of the, the most exciting ones or the most fun to talk about is really the, the private sector innovation that can come out of these kinds of partnerships. Um, and so, Todd, you kind of talked about it a little bit earlier with the Cybrarium, which I think is a very new idea for a lot of people. What are some of the other trends coming uh, in libraries that different communities should be looking for or expecting? Yeah, I think part of it is just looking at libraries a little bit differently. I think we find that, you know, the word library has different meanings for different people. It's the, still the traditional value of what libraries bring. But in most cases, almost every one of our cases now, we're part of community services. We're part of Parks and Rec. We're kind of combined with those other agencies providing services to make sure that we complement each other. We don't duplicate level of effort, but we're coordinated with the school systems, with Parks and Recs and others to provide the services that, that people want. I think they're really focused on trying to get more maximum usage out of the facilities. Buildings in particular, like a library, there's could be super expensive to build. Um, often in many communities, they're one of the nicer buildings within the community, but historically when they were only open 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week, it was kind of a, a waste of usage of that facility. So we're looking to really try to change what goes on in the buildings, the access to the buildings, the types of services you might not be surprised or surprised to see happening in a traditional library. I think you're finding in most libraries, it's less stacks of books, more open space, more technology, more meeting space, uh, more innovative, creative things that you could do within a library. Pretty much anything you can think of, it's kind of like the library of things now, whether it's a you know cooking lessons or whether it's recording studios, photography, uh, sewing machines are back in style. Um, there's you can, you know, rent tools for your to for your yard. I mean, it's just it's all over the place, but it's changed in a really good way. And that we're again, we're really trying to show people the value of the the facility and the operations that go beyond even the traditional. But we still, again, I don't take anything away from story time with kids or getting a nice, you know, hardcover book in your hands. All that still matters. Uh, but there's just so much more to what libraries are producing at this point. I love that hands-on approach you guys are talking about in terms of cooking classes or library of things. That's that's uh, I think pushing forward to your to your point. What do people expect out of their local library? Um, Jason, to you, sports, hands-on, lots of things going on, always changing there. What's what's on the horizon uh, for community leaders? Yeah, we're constantly asking you know our venue leaders, hey, what makes this a next generation facility? Right there, there are venues we've managed for 12 to 15 years. And um, as those continue to age and new venues get developed, what are we doing to take that to the next level? And, and we've mentioned programming, certainly, and, and those sorts of things. But I think as we look at the next generation complexes and facilities that are being built that, you know, again, we're, we're blessed to be a part of, um, they really are part of a larger tapestry um, within a development or a community. And they're spurring, they're kind of an anchor tenant, if you will, because of the level and volume of people that are coming in to visit um, to drive uh, other type of development, whether it's lodging or food and beverage or grocery or other commercial uses. Um, we're, we're seeing it all part of a larger master plan um, at this point. And what we're finding is a lot more um, entertainment type venues getting worked into traditional sports complexes. So, you know, whether that's pickleball, you know, social community and those sorts of things. Um, but the the food component with the social component layered into the sport and recreation piece, these are becoming lifestyle centers now um, relative to, you know, broader and larger developments. And when you're um, growing or, or bringing, attracting the level of visitors that we are from outside these communities, um, at least for those types of complexes in, um, it really is the sky's the limit in terms of what the options are. Um, so in addition to that, uh, you know, sports and uh, recreation activity is just broadening as well. Um, you know, partnership, we should partner with more libraries in our communities, having heard what Todd just said, because, you know, the camp offerings and, and all of those things, um, we can just blend in really well. We're doing a lot of corporate parties and group event business 
associated with um, cooking and, you know, Iron Chef sort of things, um, you know, as well, really anything competitive, um, you know, we're doing. But the technology piece is another big component to this um, in terms of how when people come in, what's the concierge type of service they expect, especially visitors coming in? What else can I do in the community? Where can we point them to? And so we're really looking at that concierge, um, you know, sort of service level platform, digital platform um, to help activate relationships with others in the community and point people to where they're going to have a great experience um, when they come to visit. And then maybe we'll come back to these communities again, whether they're participating in a sports complex or not, just for vacation or to hang out or to do different things. So um, we're, we're finding at least the venues that we're a part of becoming more important and critical to the overall ecosystem and economy of you know what's happening inside inside of the communities absolutely part of the fabric of the city or the town we're serving in um larry how about you what's on the horizon for emergency services technology changes coming um, obviously there's some contractions in the industry as, as to who some of the primary providers are there's next gen 911 there's first net there's a a whole host of new technology and apps coming to the market that allow a, a closer collaboration between the person calling for help and, and the people delivering help. I think one of the, the mindset challenges that local governments have to you know get past is the feeling that they might have lack of control. Um, control of the 911 environment really is is tied to both the operating budget and the capital budget and expenditures for technology and for people. And most organizations don't have a total uh, degree of control over that. They're either uh, dealing with labor issues or dealing with budget issues or don't, as opposed to taking some of those issues and just locking it down into one silo of I can find a company that can deliver these services reliably, predictably, you know, sustainably over a long period of time and allow local government officials to focus on other things that are impacting their community. Um, the technology is going to keep changing, but certainly, you know, when it's tied to the capital budget and it's tied to, you know, who's got their chance at the dollars in whatever budget cycle they're living with, um, it becomes tough. And so, you know, in the 911 arena, you have to look at the changing technology you have to suggest technologies to your clients that fit their operational and budgetary needs. Um, and, and there's there's a bit of, a, um, I would say not trust issue between vendors and um, communities, but I, I think over the long haul, you know, the vendor community really has to understand what the operational and financial metrics of their communities are and, and whether or not they can really afford to sustain, you know, that that level of commitment financially to technology platforms, but they are changing and they're changing every day. Mm, absolutely, changing rapidly. <laughs> All right, so we have just a few minutes left here. I'm gonna I'm gonna pop some popcorn some questions. So please, uh, speakers, jump in if you've got a good answer, and we'll sort through. Uh, the first question we've got comes from uh, Bill Zenz. Um, he's asking about uh, municipalities that have limited funding. Um, do you have any examples of multiple cities co-oping to share costs and revenues um, in specifically around sports or libraries or on the emergency services side? I'd be happy to take that one on, Ashley. I mean, what we found in some of these regional or shared service initiatives is that um, an entity could stand by itself, but then it has to provide everything for itself. It has to provide the legal aspects, the financial, the procurement, you know, the operational. Um, when there's a regional organization, sometimes some of those responsibilities can be shared among the participants. Um, sometimes they cannot. So, you know, obviously it's a challenge in some of these regional organizations or shared services organizations to really have a platform where everybody feels like they're getting what their community needs. Um, standalone agencies may have a higher cost, shared services agencies may have a distributed financial model, but it's it's just, um, it's a challenge for the participants. I mean, they have to, you know, get engaged in a timely fashion. 
They have to make good financial decisions in a timely fashion. Because the longer those um, issues are outstanding, the tendency to drop out of a shared uh, you know, organization uh, gets higher. Hmm. Absolutely. Anything yeah, so I'll just share one um, really quick. We have, I have a few come to mind, but I think the one that to share would be for us, it's Rocky Top Sports World, which is in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Uh, the county has actually participated then with the city of Gatlinburg and created a joint venture as it relates to how the, the assets are managed. And in that um, particular um, involvement, we, we report to both as part of a joint venture committee. And we structure the reporting in that way. And there are a number of other examples where multiple stakeholders or municipalities are involved in order to, you know, make things work. We have another question coming from Michelle Bixler. She asks, have you seen this model work in rural communities, maybe also small communities, if any of you want to touch on on that? Yeah, I'll go first on that one. Um, it works really well in small communities, rural communities. Um, particularly because they get the access to information, they get access to expertise that they wouldn't see within their own community. Still making a very local local control, but certainly they get the benefit of being part of a much larger consortium organization to make it look like a you know a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand budgeted library can operate as if it's a three million dollar library system as far as having all the resources a larger system would have at its disposal. But the critical thing is most consortiums force you to give up control. Uh, our models uh, in insist that you maintain your local control. Yeah, I actually, I'd also add that, you know, there's economies of scale and consolidations and, you know, the ability to reduce costs, both technology costs, maintenance costs, evergreening costs, as well as operational costs in a regional operation. Those are, are easy to calculate and, and they, they can be significant. All right, last question here, and then we're gonna wrap up quickly. So um, Arthur Palmer asks uh, about if, if, if a community uh, isn't gonna accept change, what do you do? How do you talk to the community leaders? Um, maybe some people who are dragging their feet, how do you convince them or advocate uh, for your kind of services? And and how would you calculate ROI a little bit of what of what they're asking? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start on this one. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we, we don't think of sales as, you know, car use car salesman <laughs> perspective. We just tell the truth that nonfiction storytelling, you know, here's the impact, here's the difference that can be made. Um, we use data, you know, in that way to to show the difference. A lot of times there is a political, there could be a political reason, you know, not to do it. It's, you know, outside of our control. And what we try to do is just get all of those issues to the top. And um, more often than not, most of the time, when all of those, um, you know, obstructions to, to moving forward are brought to the table, we can find a way to, um, you know, these guys mentioned each community, each client is different. Uh, we can find a way to customize the relationship and structure in a way that um, allows them to have their cake and eat it too, uh, because they get control, because they approve everything, because there's an annual budget and strategic planning process, and and all of those things. A lot of times, the you know the Heisman pose, the 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 restriction to moving forward, is a result of just not understanding the model, and and so we've spent a lot of time. Um, educating and uh, you know our our average time to to contract is much longer than what we would like it to be, but that's because we have to. I mean, it's almost a year sometimes because we really have to go through and build the relationships, and educate on why the model works and how we need to customize it to to work for that individual um, community. So that's that's really how we get around it. And then at times there's a few that even after you do all of that. It's still just not going to be a fit um, for political reasons or something else, and that's okay. That's okay, uh, and you know we'll move forward. And uh, a lot of times we get a phone call from them later uh, as well, so it's it's all good. Well, Ashley, as Jason and Todd have pointed out, you 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 need to in, engender trust with your clients. They have to trust you, and and those communities that are home rule oriented or are just not real interested in changing the way they do business. Sometimes you have to find a way to convince them. And generally it's based upon a business case, you know, and the business case just points out what the governance structure will be, operational metrics, you know, what the community requires, 
you know, what their technology and facility budgets are going to be. And, and sometimes the proof is just in the numbers. And, and sometimes they agree to that and sometimes they don't. And, and that's okay because uh, eventually the numbers are going to drive uh, real hard decisions for communities and we're okay with that. Well, wonderful. I first wanna say thank you so much to our incredible panelists today. We are at time. So Larry, Todd, Jason, thank you so much uh, for sharing your insight and expertise with our audience today.